Probably blueberries. Oh. Should we should we cheers? Let's do our safety cheers. Safety cheers. Cheers at home. So um, to those of you that are tuning in, let me first start by saying that I do live with three humans. Um, so we have self-quarantined together, which is why we are not practicing social isol social isolation because it's really quite impossible for us to do that in our daily lives. So as a unit, we have isolated ourselves from the other three people that live in this building. So downstairs, which maybe we'll let you see in the next you know, upcoming however amount of time we're gonna spend together, um, we have a speakeasy in our basement called the dive bar, because you gotta dive down to get into it. Mm -hmm. And there are chairs set up, you've seen it, each chair is wow. 10 feet from the other chair, both like laterally and longitudinally. Yeah. It's like a 10 foot sphere around every chair and we just go downstairs, we say when we're going down, and the next person comes down five minutes later and we have ourselves some 515 cocktails. Yeah, it's a fun little adjustment to this kind of new reality. We're still kind of getting our feet settled, but that's one thing we're doing to kind of have fun with it. Right. Uh, and after uh, you, you know, we are not doctors, but after you've quarantined for two weeks, and that means, you know, not seeing other people, um, you can start to reintroduce within your household. So I was telling our upstairs neighbor, Anne, we look so forward to giving her a hug in about 13, 14, 13 days. Yeah, because she uh, took her first day yesterday as her first day from home. So hi, welcome to, again, to Studio B on Grampian Way. I have the amazing uh, human being here, Sam Schultz. Uh, and we're going to talk about his industry, Bias Handmade. Um, we've got DJ Mateka from our last interview. He's uh, off camera receiving your comments and questions. So make sure that you keep those flying at us so that we can answer your content. Um, yeah. So thank you so much for having me on board. I'm really excited to join in this conversation. Uh, well, it's the honor. <laughs> Is yours. No, the otter, the otter is mine. Um, okay. So before we go over any of the questions that we pre approved with each other, I want to ask you, um, you know, how you decided to pick your hobby of fashion design, fashion construction learning how to sew, how did you wake up one morning or one afternoon or from a nap and say, I want to make things? Tell me a little bit about that, please. I mean, it would be a really great story if I could say, I was seven years old, I woke up, I picked up a needle and I haven't stopped since. But I think the reality is just more complicated than that. You know, I grew up with you know, two working parents, and my mom sewed a lot, not out of necessity, but she would make like really fun curtains, and she always made me a really awesome Halloween costume, and she learned how to sew because her mom knew how to sew, mm. and her mom knew how to sew because her mom knew how to sew, or her parents knew how to sew, and I think that's the case for a lot of like New England families, um, sewing and craft is such a part of kind of like the air we breathe a little bit. Mm. Um, and so I think making an artistic expression was kind of part of my household growing up and fashion specifically has always been like kind of a haven and an outlet that I've always kind of dabbled in. Um, I grew up in a really safe town, safe community, and I wore kooky weird things to school all the time because I felt safe to do that. And, um... You know, that's kind of ebbed and flowed in my list of priorities, but I think as I've become settled as like a working adult with my own income, my own stable housing, I've been able to kind of experience or experiment with that, getting back to that love of making a fashion and a style. Mm. Mm -hmm. Wow. So that's kind of how I picked it back up again. So I'd say for the last like three years, I've been doing it more as a regular practice and turned it into a little bit of a business, not necessarily to gain i mean part of to gain a new revenue stream but mostly just to make some money to buy some more supplies to make some more things really so like a, a self-sustaining hobby yeah absolutely and i think it's you know it's been such a journey but um mm -hmm. it's allowed me to explore more and that's what i want to do right now is just keep exploring more um 
I'd love to hear a little bit about um, your company name. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you want to tell people again for those that might just be tuning in what your company is called? Yeah, so I think naming my company has been also part of the fun creative process. Mm. Brainstorming like names and buzzwords and colors and imagery to go along with this thing that you're creating can be a really fun part of it. So I did a lot of thinking about what would I want to name this thing. I really approached this whole business as basically my drag. This is my drag. You know, this is my little baby, my little project that's a public persona of myself that I get to kind of shape and groom and it's a little baby right now and mm. I, I'm excited for it to grow up um, but I chose the name I landed on the name bias because it's a sewing term mm. when you when you have a fabric a woven fabric you have a grain and you have a other name that I can't remember and they weft. get woven weft yeah um, and when you cut diagonally across them that's a bias and that allows you to make collars and sleeves and curved edges because it kind of bends um, and taking that metaphor to another domain, bending and becoming flexible and adaptable, I think has always been part of queer culture. Um, and for queer people, we always experience bias, gender bias, racial bias, um, class-based biases. These aren't positive things, but they're things that we've kind of incorporated into our identities, into our survival skills, and they help us kind of go on. Mm. And so those kind of two concepts the sewing tactical thing and the social aspect I think I've put together into this idea. I think it's uh, super interesting. Uh, two nights ago with our previous guests, uh, they were talking about um, social bias and um, feeling othered and feeling perhaps that I didn't belong. And it's really kind of a, I don't think anybody unfortunately escapes that feeling at least yet. So um, I would like, you know, everybody that's at home to remember that however you're feeling tonight, you're not the only one feeling that way. Um, I think actually one thing that my therapist told me like early on was that actually everyone is a victim of something and we all have the responsibility to act. Um, and we can't always do those things at the same time, but you wake up every day and you make choices. But you're right, we've all, everyone, no matter how much privilege we have, has been a victim of something. Yeah, wow. Um, so I remember, uh, it's been a real pleasure um, watching Bias Handmade come from... Oh, tell me more. Coming from an idea to this, <laughs> whatever this is. Pepto, Bismol, Karma, <laughs> Miranda, Light Up. Hey. CC Puede, like everything. Um, <laughs> see through realness. Uh, um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, like branding and finding a logo and finding the right materials. And if those materials are, um, was it important for you to have them be renewable or to be uh, biodegradable? And sort of, could you walk us through sort of how you? <clears throat> Visually merchandised. Um, yeah, so I think there's there's like the branding process and like the making of the product process. And the branding process was really fun because I took it on as kind of like a fun creative project. So I hand drew a bunch of logos. I had a friend, my friend Taylor, shout out to Taylor, who's a graphic designer by trade, and he helped me kind of like wet internet ties the logo that I was drawing mm. um, and then I like went through several iterations of that and then I was like you know what I don't like any of this I want to keep it simple so I landed on the triangle which has a lot of significance to me personally as a queer person as a queer man um, in our history with the pink triangle um, but then on the product side you know I really have been starting off small I started making jock straps that are just like small pieces of fabric and using stretch fabric to make those and experimenting with different waistbands and seeing what I could do. Um, and the more I worked with fabric that I was getting down the street at my discount fabric store, the more I was learning about what textiles are, what they're made of, where they come from. And the more I was learning about, you know, different dye processes, different manufacturing processes, different um, synthetics how they feel on your skin, mm. how they hold up over time, over washes. And I've always been kind of a hippy-dippy person, very kind of like frugal, and I like going to thrift stores and things like that. So the environment 
you know, it's something that I became more and more concerned with. And it's not something that I've figured out yet how to incorporate that value as a primary core of my business, but um, really trying to work with more renewable fabrics. The reason why I've continued using spandex, especially with underwear, is because it's very size inclusive. So the problem with renewable, like a linen or a muslin fabric, is that you really have to tailor it to the person's body mm -hmm. to make it fit. Mm -hmm. But with spandex, you can have your body can change size over time, and you can still have that piece. Mm -hmm. And if you take care of it, if you wash it and you hang dry it, always hang dry it, it, it can last a lot longer than a woven piece might. Well, some things that I remember that I recall, like I think things that I love are that your tags are made of biodegradable material, and um, I believe, and I could be like uh, making this up, but I think your original stamp was a potato stamp. Oh, it's still that potato stamp, yeah. I mean, it's not a potato, it's a piece of rubber, but I've used this like little linoleum hand-carved stamp to stamp every tag, and that's also kind of part of the process. It's like, this is a handmade piece. I work, I spent my own time on it, and from the stamp that goes onto the tag that, you know, goes onto the garment. It's yeah, awesome. yeah. With bias. With bias. <laughs> Lily Fritz. Confronting bias. <laughs> Lily Fritz loves the potato stamp. Oh, good. See, if you use a potato, it's so easy. It's very renewable. Mm -hmm. I've used that same stamp for all my tags. Mm -hmm. Shout out, Lily. Good to see you. Uh, welcome back to Massachusetts. Uh, <laughs> Ta-da! Uh, hey, in the words of our mayor, make sure you drink water. Did I eat today? I just realized I've been dealing with a crisis all day, and my staffers asked me if I ate, and I have not. So, Earlier today, we watched a press release from Marty Walsh, and he was acting a fool, but, yeah, He I was doing the know. best he could. He was doing the best he could. Yeah. You must have a similar creative process with your drag and choosing what garments to put on. I'm actually curious, how do you choose what you wear? Wow. Um, when I choose what I wear, um, I'm often choosing who I wear. Um, so this evening, my overcoat is made by Bias Handmade. Uh, look at this, look at this. It was designed for... Um, Easter Sunday in San Francisco, which is uh, where the sisters started in San Francisco uh, 41 years ago. So they host a mega event in Dolores Park uh, with a sexy Jesus, and, well, a hunky Jesus, sexy Mary, and um, an Easter bonnet contest. Anyway, I'm digressing, but mm -hmm. I have sort of morphed into... Um, wanting to really make sure that I'm supporting local artists. So I've worked with you, I've worked with um, Elizabeth Cole Sheehan, and I've worked uh, with Stacey Stevens, uh, all of which have a flair for drama. Stacey and Elizabeth are both costume designers. Stacey's on Broadway, Elizabeth is in Boston. And I mean, if you look at this wonderful walking pinata, you will notice. <laughs> um, uh, a detail, a detailed eye for not only craftsmanship, but for fashion. So the, the things that go into my mindset are, I often will never buy off the rack mm -hmm. or buy new. So I look for uh, like kooky, beaded, embroidered, fitted, does it stretch? Can I gain 10 pounds? Can I lose 15? Um, can I pair this with something? What's its color story? So when I'm planning an outfit uh, like tonight, I was thinking, like, like, what have I worn on the, what have I put on my body the last two videos? Um, what's a color I feel comfortable in? And what's something that speaks about my ministry, which my sister name is Light of Christ. And um, as a lighting designer and a human being, I've always been referred to as sunshine, like mm -hmm. forever. Um, and so my ministry is to bring uh, light into the darker parts of our community um, that may not want it or may not know that it needs it, but to say, 
I see you, I value you. And in order to do that, I've got to um, reflect a lot. Um, that might have been a, a way like left hand turn for the question you were asking. No, I think I think what's really interesting about that answer is it just illustrates how intentional you are about the clothes you put on your body. And some people really don't take fashion very seriously, but I think it's one of those things that whether or not you take it seriously, it says something about what's going on in your mind, mm -hmm. what's going on in your emotions, what's it's saying you're just whether you like it or not, it's saying something about you to the world. Um, and some people judge it, judge other people's clothing more harshly than others, and that's just always going to be the case. Um, but I think what you are saying is also very similar to me, is that I grew up, you know, waking up every day thinking about, thinking a lot about what I was going to put on my body that day. And some of it, some of it is like, what, what's, and I think this is the case for a lot of queer people, is how safe will I feel today in what I'm wearing right now? And how much does it reflect who I really am? And unfortunately, I think queer people have to make, it's a binary choice for a lot of queer people. And I think what I'm trying to do is get to a point where we don't have to make that binary choice anymore over safety versus expressing our true selves. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what you're trying to do too. And I think that's beautiful that you make those conscious choices when you, when you go into worlds like that. Uh, likewise, one of the things I love about um, your clothing line is you were very adamant from the beginning that um like in your jock straps when i think of a jock strap i think of like the male genitals mm -hmm. that's what i think of i'm like what a beautiful device to cradle support and show off a set of cock and balls and then you came online and immediately you were like here's a version for um, for somebody that um, either uh, well, yeah that ha yes that presents with male genitalia or somebody that um, does not, and you made bulgeless jock straps, which I was like, <laughs> wow, is that our microwave? We don't know what that is. Continue. Was it the oven? Your oven just went off. I'm aware. Continue. <laughs> Don't ba don't burn your baked potatoes. Uh, are there any comments? Jim says he loves you guys from Club Cafe. Oh my god, love you, and Jim. Hi, Jim. Judy Clench said, "Oh my god, so glam." Judy Clench. So, this is an example of like a bulge list. I don't know if we can see this, but this is like a bulge list. I've got like a little top that goes with it. So okay, let me get the paper behind. Oh, the, behind, behind the, the jock. Behind yeah. the jock is that better? I don't know. We don't know. But anyways, I think the bulge, right, like I was making jock straps for friends, and then I had friends who were women, um, and I had friends who were you know, didn't invite, it did not identify as women, but wanted to wear a jock strap that didn't have a cock and balls. And um, I was like, oh, that's actually really easy, in fact, even easier, and why would we limit ourselves by just doing that? And I don't know, I think a jock strap is a fun way to queer something that's been historically masculine, which also started in Boston. By the way, jock straps. Jock straps started in Boston. They were made for bike messengers. Yeah, to bike down the cobblestone streets of Boston. Hence the first iconic brand of bike. Exactly. Think about how much easier that is with a jock strap. Oh, it's so much easier. <laughs> I have to say, um, now that we're on, <laughs> um, like two intentional things that I do, I almost exclusively wear shoulder pads. I okay, this is the new shape you're wearing. It's been a while. I know, like, if I'm in a suit, shoulder pads. Mm -hmm. If I'm in a jumpsuit, shoulder pads. Um, Have you worn epaulettes? Basically, the shoulder pads of the outer wear variety. I have seen them. I am into them, but I have currently, I have not. I'm sorry, y'all. I did not get. We were running late, and I did not get footwear. I apologize. Put those puppies away. <laughs> Look how big they are. Um, <laughs> We all have feet. Okay. Um, Sam is in a wonderful pink glitter um, pump. It's spilling over. So, um, and then the other thing that I love to do, because it's a nod to myself and to my power, mm. when you see me on the street, you can know that I am always, 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 I'm always wearing a jock. 
always. <laughs> in case you had any doubt, if you see Lida in person, the answer is yes. 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 But it's like, for me, it's a statement of self-power. I'm like, mm, mm, mm. I'm like, business on the outside, party <laughs> on the inside. It's cute. Or I'm like, my butt is one millimeter of fabric closer to these things. <laughs> well, it's funny because it's a weird thing to do to like make dog straps and like also be like a working professional with like, I don't know. So I was telling my family about like what I started to make and they were like, what? And I was like, yeah, I mean, and I was talking to like my in-laws who are like heterosexual cis men who are older and pretty like bro -y, and they're like kind of into it and I, as they should be. And yeah. Like, yeah, you can wear them for utility, for style, for bedroom fun. They have a lot of fun functions and why are you wearing boring boxer briefs when you could be wearing a jockstrap? Uh, yeah. Uh, could you tell me, um, we're going to pivot for a second. Let's pivot um, away. You've already identified as a queer person um, and as a queer man. You identified as both this evening. Mm -hmm. So um, correct me if you want me to, to um, identify you. I tell me how them, you would like to be identified. I use them interchangeably. I, I'm a queer person. Um, I'm also a man. So what what does being queer mean to you? Uh, you know, once queer, I remember years ago, maybe like 10 years ago, really resonating with the word queer as an identity for my sexual orientation and my gender and um, looking for other people, queer people online and was I was only finding women who identified as queer. Mm. So I'm so, so grateful that more men are identifying as queer or maybe cis male passing will are identifying as queer and being visible about that. Um, I think queer, you know, I'm in my 30s, and so I remember a time when my queer elders were viscerally, and still are viscerally against the term. Right. I personally embrace it so much because I just think it's such a really wonderful, inclusive shorthand um, that includes my sexuality, my sexual, my romantic persuasions, and my gender it encompasses my full expansive gender identity. Um, I think it's a really quick term. I think people get it, people grasp it. There's a real community around it. Um, and I find real power and joy in it. I absolutely understand people who don't, um, but that's where I'm at. Um, how do you promulgate acts of queerness into the world? Um, right now, I'm still a little, you know, my day-to-day -day world kind of revolves around going to my, my, I've got my work drag, which is much more kind of like business casual. I wear like my slacks and my button up. Mm -hmm. And then on the weekends, I'm much more of this pink pinata. Um, and so I would, I'm working on slowly getting to a point where the two worlds are more cohesive and I'm bringing my full self everywhere I go. I'm not there yet. And I respect that about my journey right now. Um, but the ways that I promulgate queerness, I think I'm one, I'm the only out gay man in my office. I work my day job is in the office. And so when I feel safe and it's appropriate, I speak on behalf of gay men, queer people, advocating for policy changes, trying to do the best I can for my coworkers who are also queer. Um, and then my weekend life, I mean, my family's very supportive. My friends were always talking about issues that confront us, so mm. I think I'm, yeah. Does, it, does that answer one thing? It does. I'm just going to look at the screen because I see stuff and our, um, our lady in the street is, that overcoat is fabulous. Ch -ch -ch. Hi, Raul. What's uh, from Mary Houston Tips, you shine from the inside out. You oh. look so wonderful and magical tonight. I feel better just seeing you. Thanks for being you and lifting me up. Oh, Mary. Mary! <laughs> These platelets are, we call them, they are platelets. Pi paillettes? Paillettes. 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 These platelets, iridescent platelets, y'all. They're in my blood. Uh, there's, I'm always like, should I sit? Should I sit? <laughs> well, they oh, dig into me. I know they're harsh. This is this is actually not the most renewable source to work with, but 
if you keep it well, you've already worn. You know, okay. Here, I read a book recently that was about. It gave me a good frame of reference for fashion, and it said you should think about not the price tag of when you're buying it, but how many times you'll wear a piece. Mm. So it's like a cost per wear. So, and this kind of justifies not buying fast fashion like H and M. So if you buy a twenty-five dollar shirt at H and M, you wear it once. You wash it, it gets mangled, and then you never really want to wear it again. That's a $25 wear. Versus if you buy a $50 shirt, that's maybe more quality, and you get 50 wears out of it, that's a dollar per wear. Yeah. I have that beautiful leather coat from a English leather company. I won't name them by name. Um, <laughs> but they've got a bunch of sewing machines in their window. Mm. Um, I've had that coat for maybe seven years. And although I don't fit in that coat anymore, other people do, and it looks beautiful. It I love seeing weird. you in it. It gets weird. Yeah, it was worth the investment. Mm -hmm. It paid It paid itself back in spades. Yeah. I feel like we should play bridge someday so that we know what that turn of phrase actually means. Yeah, <laughs> spades. <laughs> it pays itself back in spades. I know. Like, I'm like, or like outdoor hard. spades? Right, right. <laughs> The ones you guarded with? Yeah, hoes? <laughs> Am I gonna get hoes? <laughs> um, what else do we have on our little list? Would you be open to talking about um, what coming out means for you? Well, like many gay people know, coming out is a lifelong process, it's not just one event. Um, the first time, I think the first and hardest time of coming out was coming out to myself. Yeah. Um, and that was when I probably was in eighth grade walking home from school and I put the dots to, con I connected the dots between like looking at gay porn on the internet and then like gay as an abstract idea that I've heard about in the world. And so when those two dots connected for me, I was like, oh shit. And then, you know, like shame spiraling, a little bit of depression found a really wonderful, wonderful out bisexual female friend who yes. led me through that. The Underground Railroad. Mm -hmm. They were like, come with me. Come with me. I see you. I see you, queer person. Um, and building that relationship, that friendship, gave me the confidence to tell my parents, um, and my well, my friends, and then my parents, and then and then everyone knew. Um, but then, you know, that but then that's the beginning of the journey, right? So then I go to college with a whole new set of people, a whole new set of circumstances, had to come out again. Um, graduated college, went out into the working world, had to decide whether, who wants to know when. Um, luckily my voice usually outs myself for me, um, as do my mannerisms, which I feel grateful for that privilege. Some people have to do extra work to come out. Mm. Um, but yeah. So I've been thinking about those people. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was just, people. I went very far away and I was like but then that's huh. that's coming out of, like it's easy to come out or it's it's more known it's a common narrative to come out as gay or as a lesbian but coming out with a gender identity that's maybe not man or woman is a lot more complicated now yeah um you know I people know at work that I'm a gay man not that even though I haven't said it out loud really in like a staff meeting but they don't maybe they, they don't really know that I identify as queer like I don't in introduce myself as queer at work mm -hmm. um, and that's not something that I would ever hide but it's also not something that's ever really asked so it's right. like you got to kind of feel out your spaces as us queer people are very you know we're pretty good at because we have to be so the sisters were hosting bingo at club cafe um, Come on, Club Cafe. The oh god, just a, just like a handful of days ago. No, not a handful of days ago. Like a few weeks ago. Let's mm -hmm. be let's be real. Yeah. Um, right. And I have to tell you that I witnessed a coming out. Like I. Oh my goodness! I witnessed in the it wild. In the wild, but it wasn't an I'm gay coming out. It was mm. a different type of coming out within the queer narrative. Ooh. It was. Please do elaborate. I will, but I'm gonna degender and okay. de. Okay. Small I, community. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So it was a couple. Okay. And it was supposed to be like an, an intimate dinner party, and somehow it like belonged to like three or four of their friends. And the intention of this intimate dinner party was to begin 
uh, talking about that they were non-binary, potentially trans, and so they were coming out. Wow. And the partner was taken by shock. It was maybe not quite reacting uh, with empathy yet. I think they were going through their first round stage of reactions, but it was in a public space. It was in a public space. There may have been, there definitely was some level of like imbibement that had happened. So on Mm. top of that, you had like lowered... Um, oh, I see. Lowered inhibitions, and it was it was fascinating um, to decide how long should I observe this? Mm-hmm. Am I David Attenborough, and do I have to go by the National Geographic policy, where I'm like, there's the penguin, the penguin is going to get eaten, but I cannot intervene, or do I dive bomb into this situation and use like comedy and like redirection? Oh, did you insert yourself? I did, but I thought I was inserting into the person that was having the self-affirming mm. statement, but they were out in the restroom, and so I had gotten the okay. I had gotten the partner, which was also equally good because I just went, you know, like how are you? And they were like, not so good right now, and I was okay, like, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. do you want a hug? And they were like, I want that more than anything. Ugh. So I gave them a hug. And then you just got to hope that people figure, you know, when you come out, it gets easier over time. But the first one what I is, generally, generally. is real hard. It can be, it can be hard on yourself. It can be. Well, I would say my learning. Yeah, my advice if anyone who's considering coming out, whether it's about their sexuality, their gender, or what have you, right, the first time is usually the hardest because you're saying it out loud maybe for the, for the first time. But I would recommend doing it in a car with someone. Having hard conversations in a car is really not always the best idea. No, I, well, I would say if you're driving Boop. or maybe Boop. you're a passenger, it's hard to have, okay. Deep, 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 back pedal, back pedal. I would say some hard conversations are easy to have in a car because you're not facing the person. Ah. And you kind of have like a rhythm and a motor. That being said, if you're having a high emotions conversation, it is not good to be behind the wheel. Also, make sure you're somewhere safe. Don't be on I-90. Don't be in, like, Saskatoon. Don't be in a place where they could be like, I'm pulling over, you're getting out. But the point being, so maybe not in a car, but if you're in a place where you've got, you've got like, your hands are busy, maybe, like, you're, like, sewing or you're cooking, you don't have to maintain hard eye contact with the person you're trying to tell something heavy to. That can make it a lot easier. That's all I'm saying. That's an interesting coping and bit of advice. Therapists use it all the time. Social workers use it all the time. I would really advocate, though, for connection and eye contact, but yeah, upon your own, important. do your thing. Um, do you have any, like, I would like you to, like, pick back into time. Like, let's take the, let's open the vault. We're going back. What is that? We're going to open the box of high school. We're going to pull it off the shelf, and we're opening it up. Ooh. Right. We're going to look inside. Do you have any, like, hilarious coming out stories? Oh, my gosh. Uh, um, coming out, yes. Um, well, when I, I came out to my mom because she was dating a woman at the time, and her girlfriend caught me making out with my boyfriend. <laughs> so there was that. Um, but... I mostly have like embarrassing fashion stories from high school. Oh. Like that's I, a good pivot. That was a good reader. I wore the weirdest things to high school every day. I think the first pair of pants I made, are you ready for this? I cut I took a pair of camo pants and a pair of worn out pink plaid, very thin pajama pants, cut them in half and sewed them together by hand. And wore them to school. It was not cute. Like pajamas one side, camo on the other. <laughs> like thick canvas camo and like thin worn out pajamas. 
and I'm just like walking which down the which side? side? I don't know. I think that I'm pretty sure the pajamas were on the right side and the camel was on the Oh, side. you bisected? You went I down died, the down the mid. I always thought maybe you flayed them and so like, <laughs> the back. <laughs> that probably that would have made so much more sense. <laughs> But yeah, no, I yeah, wore those outrageous that. things. And you know what? I'm so grateful that I wore those outrageous things then because I kind of worked through what I like, what I don't like. And now some people are doing that now. And I totally applaud that journey. Um, I'm glad I, I'm at this part of my journey. So we're going to close <laughs> that box. Now we're going to pivot. I'm opening up mine. Ooh, what's in yours? What's in your box? Okay, in my box, picture it. North Station, before they renovated it. Of course, of course. <laughs> um, I'm in line with Patty Silva and Leah Goodstadt. Mm. We were coming back, I think, from a high school trip, either to the Museum of Science, or it was some type of like community leaders building exercise with Lenny Zakum at the TD Garden. We got Patty. We got Lenny. Cool. Lenny Zakum was the man that the bridge is named after. Oh, right, right, right. Go on. Um, <laughs> Catastrophe! <laughs> um, and so I come up and I go, hey, uh, hey, Patty and Leah. Hey, Patty and Leah. Hey. I'm bi. And they went, you're buying? <laughs> and I was like, I'm bisexual. And they were like, oh. Um, so, so, oh, I also have the bisexual on ramp. I love the bisexual on ramp. Now listen, bisexuality is actually a real thing. Yeah. Um, but sometimes we use it as a. Um, and that's unfortunate for the bisexual community. I have some controversial feelings on that, but that's where I'm at. Is, is Matthias commenting from your phone as yeah, you? I think, I don't know. Maybe. I love this. Here, let's fix this light. You know, Oprah doesn't have to do this. <laughs> Are you putting yourself on Oprah's level? And why shouldn't I? Exactly. Okay. This is cute. Oh. So I have to ask you, mm. what do you think about what's going on right now? You know, I'm still working through all my feelings of what's going on right now. Um, it's there's like a lot of conflicting reports. There's a lot of rumors. Um, I think we're still learning about a lot of information what's happening. Um, I would agree with the general consensus that we need to stay home. We need to kind of wait this out and we need to just kind of be patient as um, our leaders in all sorts of agencies, um, science leaders, I was, I was about to state leaders um, really kind of put their heads together with the resources that they have at their disposal and then tell us piddly folks on the ground what's going on. And in the meantime, we can work, we, we could be working from the ground up to do what we can to be responsible, to not have parties, to not be reckless with our bodies um, right now. Yeah. Um, stop having sex with people from apps. Stop it. Two weeks. Let's see if we can do it. I know. Let's right? Can do it. No not November. You know what's also been what all what I've also been feeling is just generally you know, there's a lot of like self care tips out there like stop checking social media, take breaks, like drink water. And I think those are easy to rattle off and actually hard to practice. Mm. Like I found that when I do actually turn my laptop off, turn my phone off, and go for a walk for half an hour, I come back feeling so much better right. than, than when I'm just in the thick of it. And some of us have to be in the thick of it for work purposes or whatever, but um, you're the one, you're the boss of your body, and you can give yourself permission to take breaks. And so we, we need to be doing that right now. So something that's giving me a little bit of hope mm -hmm. um, you know, some people believe that the sisters can't be political, and what that means is that we can't um, canvas or right. um, lobby. Because of 501c3 status. Right, because of your 501c3 status. Yeah. But I can commentate. Okay. 
why don't you define commentate for us? I'm going to tell a story. Okay. I'm... Buckle me in. So here's something that is giving me life. Mm. Are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> life. Uh, Wanton said hi. Queen Dilly Dally said hi. Hey, Queen Dilly hi. Dally. Who, which Wanson? Beth Wanson. Beth! Hey, honey. Um, reporters uh, at the White House are not, like, they're starting to not hold back punches. So today, once he went, the Chinese virus. And she went, she raised her hand, he called on her, and she went, when are you going to stop calling it the Chinese virus? It's racist, it's divisive, and you're hurting people. He went, I'm not a racist, that's where it's from. China. He said it, he said it like a high school bully dick. You know, he's got his, he's got his regular China, and then he's got China. And he said, China. Yeah. I think we can all agree that whatever his demeanor is, it, it is what it is, and we can choose differently. Do you mean we could vote? We can choose with our votes, we can choose with our behaviors, we can choose with our words. Just because that man called the, Ch- the Chinese virus does not mean we get to, or can, or he should, or can. But we cannot stand silent in the face of bigotry Mm -hmm. intolerance or injustice that is a part of the sister's creed i will not stand Mm -hmm. silent and let me tell you when a leader regardless of what country they're leading Mm. uh minimizes and ostracizes another people for any reason Mm-hmm. That is unacceptable. We are beyond that. 